OK, here we go. Don't adjust your, your sets at the moment. This isn't 2021, but there is a warm welcome back. Here we go to Sky Sports News alumni. Jim White is here. Uh, Good morning, to everybody. To celebrate 25 years of the channel. Uh, you have made your day, Jim. Oh, I'm feeling great. I must admit, this place looks fantastic. It's a heck of a lot better than when I was here. You've given it a lick of paint, Rob. It looks good, my friend. Well, I've got to fill my spare time somehow. Uh, yeah. and, uh, it looks good. It's and I must great admit, to be here. It, it was emotional, but I went through it. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Carve is here as well. The reason Carve is here uh, to, to bring a sense of gravitas as well. But there is a new book, Jim. Uh, yeah. Deadline Day, it is called. This is our opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. W what's the best camera to pick it up on? There we go. Camera three, always the same. Yes, uh, Deadline Day. Jim White and Cavi Solicol. It's all our work. And we're damn well proud of this, are we not? Yes, it's coming out tomorrow. The inside story of football's transfer market. So if you're interested in transfers... Uh, interested in books, it could be something that you may be interested in buying. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's got all the stories, Rob, about how Deadline Day came about, uh, the early days of it, the impact that it made, and the impact, as you remember, was enormous. Uh, it's, to be fair, it surprised us all. Uh, and thereafter, some of the biggest moves, and this man has worked his tail off getting it all down in book form. So we think at 25 quid, <laughs> this, this is an absolute cinch. So, uh, if I were you, get your bookshops as of tomorrow. That's a big sale done. OK. Um, you have presented all 43 of those, whether it be on, on television here at Sky Sports News or now on radio. Did you have to think long and hard about what you call the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. It's not exactly original. But deadline day, when you talk about deadline day, Rob, and again, this gives me an opportunity to hold up, but the yellow deadline day letters, everything was yellow and still is. Uh, many people still stop me in the streets and say, you know, what was it about the yellow tie? What was it about the, the, the yellow lettering and everything like that? And as you and I remember, it was all about... It was all about on the day. Well, there's the famous tie. That's now in the National Football Museum in Manchester next to the late John Motson's sheepskin coat. I, and I, I tell no lie there. And um, everybody talked about the yellow tie. Why, why did you go yellow on that day? It was synonymous with breaking news. You know, the black lettering against the yellow background. And if you, if you watched that, you were assured breaking news was coming along. Mm. Of, some, of some description. Yeah, uh, and the breaking news is that Carve was involved in this as well. Now, Carve, uh, I, I, like you, I've known Jim for many, many years. So was writing this book almost like trying to herd kittens at some moments with, with Jim? <laughs> no, it was very easy. It was, was a, it? it was a really simple process. I mean, we were approached by the publishers and they wanted a book about transfers and obviously they wanted a Jim involved, they wanted me involved as well. I think we took a little bit of convincing to uh, agree to do it, but yeah, finally... finally we, we played hard to get. Yeah, we finally thought it was a good idea. And we didn't want it to be... You know, Jim didn't want it to be his autobiography. So it's not a book about, oh, you know, I grew up in Glasgow, this is the first game I went to, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not his autobiography, although it's got, of course, elements of his life and career in there. And it's not just looking back at some of the big transfer stories of the past, because we all know those, and you can find out about those uh, on, on the internet if you want to, you know, to read up about those. This is more about what Jim is asked a lot when he stopped on the street, and what I'm asked a lot as well is, where do you get transfer stories from? Mm, mm. How, how do you get these stories? You know, do you just make them up? Uh, you know, how do you make your contacts? How do you get people to speak to you? Yeah. You know, that whole process. So it explains it all, you know, about how to become a football reporter, how to make contacts, how to get stories. And also there's a lot of information in there from, for instance, agents' points of view, what they think of what Jim and I do, what they think about the whole explosion and in interest in transfers. There's a lot in there from owners' Of football clubs as well, players, managers, and there's also a chapter about what's happening in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Yeah, the whole explosion in transfers in, uh, you know, the Saudi Pro League. So, if you're interested in transfers, and if you're interested in the media, and you're interested in maybe one day doing what Jim does for a living, I think it's a pretty good read. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I like that, Jim. I mean, it, it, when we were young, which 
a long time ago. A, a, a few moons My ago. My fellow grey-haired friend. A, a, a few yeah. moons ago. I mean, we, we used to have this sort of watered-down version of transfer. It's sort of March time, wasn't it? And clubs weren't allowed to to sell That's right. or, or buy after that. And, yeah. Uh, I, I can remember sitting in the newsroom, the ticker tape coming out, and you could see who bought who. Are you surprised, though, that how popular it became? I mean, at one stage, people were demanding a bank holiday, weren't they, for transfer deadline <laughs> yes, days? Yes, yes. I was with the them. interest. I, I, I was demanding a bank holiday. Um, I, you're right, Rob. It became, you and I remember we were here when it really, really almost spiralled out of control. It, it became a phenomenon and still is. Um, and I, I think it, it's the excitement that it, it, it generates amongst football fans who are the most important people of the lot. And they want to know who their club is going to get. They want to know who the owner of their club is going to try and provide £25 million for. And, and they, they stick with us to try and go from the beginning to the end of the story and hope that it's a happy ending. But um, I must admit, Rob, not everybody is a fan of Transfer Deadline Day. Our good friend Simon Jordan, the former owner of Crystal Palace, uh, there's a chapter uh, in there from him. And, of course, as a former owner, it was a time that he says he dreaded because he was going to have to shell out a lot of money. Sometimes the investments in players that he would make were not maybe the right ones. The, the, the moves that they made didn't work out for his particular club. So maybe he wasn't the biggest fan of it. So we've tried to give it a lot of balance. This man's written it very, very well. Um, uh, if I was writing it, we'd still be waiting for the, the book to come out. But um, I, I think we've covered all bases. And I think we've got all the movers and shakers that go into what makes Transfer Deadline Day such a phenomenal day. And it still is. I emphasise, it still is. Mm. Many people still say to me, what's the biggest story you covered? I'm like, and I mean this, Rob, I don't know because I don't think I've covered it yet. It hasn't happened yet. It's still to happen. And I honestly, honestly believe that. And Cavi and I and your good self have been across some of the biggest moves that ever took place in the game. Yeah, and, and sometimes, Jim, as you know well, it's the transfers that don't happen that sometimes capture our imagination. I think you know yeah. which one in particular I'm thinking of. I know where you're going with that. Was that the famous night of Peter Odom Wingy? We cover this in the book, of course. Now, Rob, I was in this very studio that night when Peter Odom Wingy, then of West Brom, pitched up at Loftus Road and uh, was telling a reporter down there, yeah, here I am, and I very much hope to get a move to Queen's Park Rangers. And, of course, as we all know, that move didn't happen. And we have spoken to Peter about it. Peter Odom Wingy, incidentally, is a terrific guy. Lovely, lovely bloke. And he tells us the truth behind that night and why he ended up at Loftus Road uh, in, the, in the dead of night and why he hoped that that move would go through. And it wasn't all down to him just pitching up there on a whim. He'd been told, if this move is to get done, you better get down to Queen's Park Rangers. And that's exactly what he did. Thereafter, it was an absolute mess. And he goes into why it's still the one that he stopped and, and spoken to about in the street. So Peter Odom Wingy, that move very much uh, features in the book. Yeah, and, and by the wonders of, of television time machine, uh, let, let, let's give for, for people who may not uh, remember it a, a little favour of, of what was happening. I don't think we've ever had this before in a transfer deadline night. West Brom striker Peter Odom Wingy is trying to force through a deadline day move to Queen's Park Rangers. Will you definitely be keeping our player as of this evening? Uh, well, it's not 100%. It's not sorted yet, but I hope West Brom will be happy with what, uh, what uh, they will get. And, of course, uh, they're hoping to get few players themselves. So I just hope things will go well in the last few hours. The window is shut. <laughs> I still sit bolt upright in bed, Rob, and say, the window is shut. <laughs> um, but Odin Wingy's great, Rob. He speaks in the book about what happened there. It was, it was red faces all round, uh, including for him. But he then went on to finish his career banging in goals elsewhere, Stoke City, I believe. So, I mean, he still showed that he could do it at a very, very decent level, even although that move fell through. And Cavi writes about it brilliantly. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting moment in the book. Mm. There's a good story in there as well you told about John Hartson uh, because he was well, somebody yeah. you spoke to for the book as well about how he could have well, he, right. he could have played for Rangers instead of Celtic. You, you might remember this, um, Rob. John Hartson, of course, man of a number of clubs and a, a, and a good goal scorer at that as well. Um, it's largely forgotten that John Hartson almost became a Rangers player 
and went up there and was heartbroken when it all went wrong in the medical and was, was told, sorry, John, we just can't sign you. You have a dodgy knee. So John left ex extremely crestfallen that the move didn't go through, uh, travelled back south, carried on with his career, much wounded by the fact that this was uh, extremely public, that the move to Rangers had fallen through. And where did he end up? With Martin O'Neill at Celtic. And the rest was history. And Rangers' loss was very much Celtic's gain because Hartson was a phenomenon mm. in that Celtic side with Larson and Sutton and the rest. And John Hartson tells us the story behind that. Yeah. Um, obviously, Hartson and Kitson uh, were two integral buys for one of your other famous uh, uh, interviewees during your time here. We'll get on to Harry Redknapp uh, oh, uh, Harry. A, a, a little yeah. later. We'll, yeah. we'll save that one. But it, 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 interesting what Carvey was saying is, is it's not just about um, what happens here, it's about what happens in the background and, and, and getting those stories. And you, you, you seem to have that wonderful knack, Jim, of... of Turning up in the most exotic players <laughs> to speak to the most uh, exotic places, speak to the most exotic people. Um, so uh, I'm thinking Vincent Tan. Vincent Tan, the Cardiff City owner. I remember that, Rob. I was in here. The, there was a story on the go about Vincent Tan. He was none too happy with uh, some of the text messages that were flying around about him. Flying around being right, that's me in that helicopter. And Vincent Tan uh, wanted to talk uh, about a whole variety of things. He's a kind of controversial figure. So myself and Spiney, the cameraman, uh, flew overnight to Kuala Lumpur. And then we were told to be in the roof of the hotel the following morning and a helicopter would take us to Vincent Tan's £50 million yacht. And there he was greeting us on the deck of the yacht, as only Vincent could do, wearing, yes, Cardiff fans, you've spotted it, a red Cardiff City shirt, which was... A bit of a, 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 a mind-blowing moment for Vincent. If he could uh, live his life again, he wouldn't have done that because, as you know, the blue of Cardiff is very, very important to all Cardiff City fans. Vincent decided the red of Malaysia would look good for Cardiff and he went red and uh, the Cardiff City fans did not like that. I, I think Vincent gave me that red Cardiff shirt and I think I've still got it in my house. But that was, that was a trip and a half. I must admit, Rob, I remember before we flew back the following morning, uh, the cameraman and myself stayed on Vincent's yacht. And I remember closing my eyes thinking, I'm in the South China Sea bobbing about on Vincent Tan's yacht. What am I doing? <laughs> but Jim it was White, a phenomenal experience. Where did it all go wrong? We've seen you on a, on a, on a yacht with Vincent Tan. Uh, but, I mean, I, we've got to spare a thought and a moment here uh, for Harry Redknapp, who even on Christmas Day cannot escape Jim White. Let's have a look at this. <laughs> I remember it. I do remember it. Tony Fernandez, your yeah. owner. Yeah. He, he's a great fan of Transfer Deadline Day. And I'm thinking, what can I give you to help you? So there we are. I think you should wear that when yeah. you get in front of him, Harry, on Transfer Deadline Day. When you want to try and get him, persuade him to give you some funds to get a player, you right. will not fail if you wear my Transfer Day yellow tie. Oh, my God, Jim, that is a beauty. I don't know. Uh, I don't normally wear that make a tie, Jim. I've got to be true. <laughs> um, oh, he's brilliant. But, brilliant. It, but uh, we're going to have a look at this as well, because it's not just Harry and, and the yellow tie. Here's Jose. Oh, go on. Jose, just for you, my friend, I want you to be sitting at home on, on this occasion, in this okay. transfer deadline day, and I would really like you to wear that for us okay. and for everybody on Sky Sports. Will, will Chelsea be featuring, do you think? On deadline day, will you be in there with a big signing? I don't think so, but I will be enjoying my Joshua for sure. Oh, Jose. I'll tell you what happened straight after that, Rob. Uh, he said to he me... He went on his yacht in the South China <laughs> Sea? No. He, no. Oh. He, he, he says to me, I am a huge fan of transfer deadline day and to have this yellow tie, wow, what a thrill. So that was it. We turned off at the end of the interview. I said, Jose, I can't thank you enough. He said, here, have this back. <laughs> <laughs> Give me it back. Give me it back. But, uh, no, he, the, the, you know the message that comes over there, though, with Redknapp, Mourinho, Rob? They all played a part in the day. Everybody wanted to get involved in the day. You know what it was like in this place. Um, the place was buzzing from early morning, and everybody knew their job and got on with their job very, very well indeed. And um, the, the whole country tuned into Sky Sports News, and still does, and tunes into this fella uh, uh, until, uh, uh, until this very day now. And... I think it's great because, as I say, Mourinho played a part. Harry played a part. 
everybody was involved in it. Everybody wanted to get involved in it. And it, it was great theatre on the telly. And I think in those days, actually, something that's changed about the way transfers are covered is, you know, the, the times Jim is talking about are pre-social media, pre-smartphones. Yeah. You know, now there's so much information available on social media. And also, if you want to contact agents or players or, or managers, you know, if you're lucky enough, you will be able to do that using messaging uh, services on your phone. When the days Jim's talking about, there was no social media. There were no smartphones. The only way you could interact with people like Harry Redknapp and Jose Mourinho was to get to know them, to get their numbers. Yeah, yeah. And they had to like you because you needed them to give you the time of day. <laughs> and for whatever reason, you know, Jim is a likable person. They like Thank you, Jim. Kirby. Thank you. You know, they'd give, they'd give him their Very phone true, number. <laughs> and that's how, you know, you'd get their numbers, you'd have a relationship yeah. with them. And, yeah. that, and that's how you would get stories. And that, well, that's been lost a little bit now. I mean, I would, because I would, everything's done on smartphones. I would say, I'll get back to him later, but I would say, uh, without this, none of what I used to do and still do to an extent would happen, to be honest, Rob, because, I mean, I've got, a, I've got about... A, I mean, it's not the big I, I am, but I've got about a couple of thousand contacts on this. Of course, a small percentage of the people I speak to on a regular basis, but it's having that opportunity to be able to make contact with these people immediately. And I think that is something that Cavi drives home in, in the book. Um, for anyone growing up wanting to get into to, to this business, it's vitally important that you know, you know people. It's vitally important that you can contact people. There's a group of lads in with us here today at Sky Sports News. We were just saying the same thing to them in the last commercial break. You want to do this job? Get contacts and be able to contact those people. Because uh, if you want information, information's God. And that's how you go about it. Yeah, we've got about a minute, 40 seconds left. Uh, 25 years of Sky Sports News uh, and, and your career for you. Pick one, the standout moment. Oh, my goodness. There are so many. On, on the deadline days themselves, there were so many different stories. One thing came back to me the other day, Rob, and we actually we, we, we don't mention this in the book, but I'll mention it now. I, I coincidentally met Patrick Vieira in London one day and he invited me to join him in Senegal, in West Africa, just a few weeks later, uh, where Vieira was going to open his own soccer academy. And I'd never seen anything like it. Myself, a producer, Gary Hughes, who's still here uh, at Sky, and a cameraman, Greg, I think it was, we all went out to Senegal and watched Vieira go in amongst the Senegalese people. And those memories are still with me. He was incredible to watch. He was so generous. He was godlike to them and still is but he was magnificent and uh, he was so humble. That is a huge memory I have. Um, the opportunity to travel, I grabbed with both hands anytime I could here at Sky, mainly to get out of here and to talk to people like you. <laughs> but uh, I'm joking. Uh, it, it, it's been great and much of it is captured in here in the book by Cavi. So, I mean, there's bound to be a follow-up and we'll tell you when that comes out. Yes, uh, and I you know will look saying? forward to it. <laughs> Carve, you managed to get a few words in, and well done for that. That's an amazing achievement. Um, lovely to see you, Carve, and Jim. Uh, wonderful to see you back. Those it transformed me in time, and uh, I was back uh, in those days. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. you. Great always. seeing you, Rob. And we're both healthy, and that's the main thing. Yay! Yeah, <laughs> lovely to see, to you, see you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Carve.